Welcome to the Western Bell podcast series with talks on traditional spiritual teaching and its application in the world today. The intention of the series is to offer something useful for those who are drawn to study themselves and engage practice on the spiritual path. New talks are posted twice each month. The content of the talks is for informational purposes only and not to provide any kind of counseling, medical, or professional advice. This podcast is titled, What the Heck is a Guru? The talk was given by Rick Lewis on February 17, 2024, via Zoom. Rick is a national speaker and author of Seven Rules You Were Born to Break, The Perfection of Nothing, You Have the Right to Remain Silent, and other books. In this talk, he speaks about the mystery of the guru, who appears in different times and places through telling stories of his relationship with his guru, Lee Lozowick. He describes his experience of the inexplicable energetic field around a guru who functions outside the usual reference point of a separate individual. Rick notes that altered states that feel incredibly profound can be used to maintain a separate sense of self, as if we are getting closer to enlightenment. He states that, if we have not had the experience of a guru, all of us have the access point of feeling connected beyond our usual frame of reference with who the guru actually is, and that spiritual literature can also be an access point. If there is benefit in this talk for you, please consider sharing the link to it or writing a review on social media or on one of the podcast platforms. Rick Lewis. I had been thinking a fair bit lately about. My last guru, I've had a couple, my last guru, Lee Lozowick, and I've been writing down some stories about Lee, and it has brought to mind for me how much there is yet to unpack and to experience from my encounters with my guru. I've lived near my guru and away from my guru. And as of late, I've been away for about two years from the core community where most people hang out. And I have moved away from the form of my guru, both in terms of being near my sangha, people who are students of my guru, and the teachings, the dharma. I don't read very much Dharma lately. I used to a lot. I haven't hardly in years. And what's coming up for me is kind of a revisitation of going back to who Lee was for me and who he is in me. And all that time, the non-referencing of him so much externally feels like him going deeper and deeper inside of me. And as I've been reflecting on my experiences with Lee, the awareness that comes up in me is I have no idea who this guy was. I was a student for like 25 years or 30 years. I don't know. I lost track. I don't know who this person is. I don't even know if he is a person. I don't know what a guru is. It's a mystery to me. People talk here who have insight and depth. I feel like I have sort of the opposite of that right now. I have a direct relationship to this mystery of this kind of person that apparently shows up on earth from time to time that is inexplicable in many ways, especially in relationship to a Western perspective Western way of thinking. So I've had two, say, root gurus. The first one was Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, renamed Osho later. And I don't know if anyone saw the Wild Country series on Osho, but I was there for four or five years in the middle of that whole thing. So that was a whole guru experience. The guru phenomena is really interesting because I think there's two things going on at the same time. I grew up wanting to know I'm loved, appreciated, and approved of. 
and basically looking for that wherever I could find it. And I think my primary means of finding that and looking for it was to perform. I was a comedian and a juggler and an actor. So being on stage was my way of trying to be liked, useful, loved. Who isn't looking for that? We're all looking for that in our own way somehow. So in my teens, I started reading books like, does anyone remember Richard Bach? Can anyone read Richard Bach? Yeah. So these kind of esoteric teachings, writings, Richard Bach, a guy named Leo Biscaglia, and Ken Keyes, Handbook to Higher Consciousness. Anyone ever read Handbook to Higher Consciousness? Run into that decades ago. Had a huge impact on me. I was really hungry for ideas that would provide some kind of escape from this anxiety and sense of being separate and confused and anxious about my place in the world and my relationship to other people. And so spiritual teachings were on one hand something I hungered for because I was looking for psychological relief. And then I started running into books like Ram Dass's Be Here Now, and then Miracle of Love, Neem Karoli Baba. That's who that's about, right? And then I'm reading these spiritual books that had directly to do with stories about masters or what I heard was gurus. And I was this kid living in Little Rock, Arkansas, this white American jock athlete. That's how I identified myself. My father, a teacher, a scientist. My mother, an English major and librarian. I'm about as straight as it gets in terms of white, middle-class America kind of kid. And here I am running into these books that I don't understand because I would read this stuff and the subject matter of these teachers, masters, guru, were getting inside of me and starting to radiate outward in a way that I was being moved and touched. Things were moving around inside of me. I had no clue what to make of. I just knew that I was being shown something or introduced to something that I knew was true. And it had to do with escaping or transcending or finding relief from that sense of me being this very separate, isolated person in the world. So I'm reading these books. Some of that was before university. Then I went to university for acting conservatory, ran into some very interesting practices and training there that I was given about being a more self-aware person, basically, in acting school. So that opened me up a little further. And then I quit university after my second year. One, because it was a very competitive acting program, and they did an automatic cut of the class. You had to audition to get in in the first place, then they cut half the class at year two. And you had no say. You were either in or out. I was so freaked out about that. I decided I was going to leave the program before I could get to where I'd be cut. So they told me after I would have made it, but it didn't matter. I was too absolutely freaked out about it. So I went back to Little Rock, Arkansas, where my parents were. And my mom's got these interesting friends who are into some alternative stuff. And one of her friends comes to a woman's night at our house in Little Rock. I'm 19 or something. And she walks in and she's got a book in her hand. And she says, I've got this book. It's disturbing to me. I don't know what to do with it, but maybe your son would like it. I know Rick is kind of into this sort of stuff. So she hands me this book, and the book is The Mustard Seed by Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh by Osho. So I take the book. I take it into my room. It's a pretty big book, a big, thick book. I take it into my room at about, I don't know, 8 p.m. or something. 
And I couldn't put it down. I read this entire book front to back in about six or seven hours. And I got to the end of the book and I did not know what was happening to me, but I knew without a shred of a doubt that I was meant to go find this man, this person, wherever he was. And I got to the end of the book and I opened the last page and it said, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh is currently in Pune, India, where he teaches at his ashram. So I'm at home with my parents. I've got a room there. And the next day, I announced to my parents, I'm moving to India. And they're like, what? My poor mom. I said, I'm going to India. And they're like, why? I don't know. I didn't know how to explain it. I just knew in my being, I had to do this. So I'm in, in Little Rock, Arkansas. And oh, I think at that point I had moved out. It was either with my parents or in my own apartment. So, okay, first thing I need to do is get a ticket to go there. I'm sure about this, but also freaked out of my linear middle-class white boy, white bread American mind. Because I'm like, what am I doing? Why? What is going on here? But I'm also sure about it. So I go and open the yellow pages, no internet back then. And I flip through and there's like 40 travel agencies. Boom. And I put my finger on a travel agency. I get my car. I drive downtown and I go to this travel agency. I walk into the front door of the travel agency and I go to the reception desk and I say, I need to go to India. I need a ticket to go to India. And the travel agent says, oh, okay, well, go back and see Lynn. And there's 20 or 30 agents. This is a different time period. There were things called travel agencies and travel agents. And there was a bunch of them in there. Go see Len. So I walk to the very back of this travel agency. I'm in Little Rock, frickin' Arkansas, where gurus and spirituality and India, nobody knows about any of this kind of stuff. I go to the very, very back of the travel agency. I sit down. I'm super nervous. And I look at this woman. She says, hi, how can I help you? And I said, I need to go to India. And she just looks at me and she says, where in India? And I say, Pune. And she looks at me and she says, are you going to see Bhagwan? And I'm flipping out of my mind. Because it turns out this woman was one of two sannyasins in the entire state of Arkansas. There were two known sannyasins in the state of Arkansas. And I had wound up there at her desk. She's the one who told me right then and there, Bhagwan has just left India. She knew he had left India weeks ago and was now in Oregon. So if I had not run into her specifically, I would have been on a plane to India and would have gotten there and there would have been no guru in Pune. So that was one of my first experiences along the lines of not only what the heck is a guru, what is the fabric, the framework what is the field that is operating around people, individuals who have connected outside of the bounds of the usual separative reference point we all exercise? For those who have entered a field that's different than that, what's going on? What's operative there? And these kind of stories you hear all the time. If you read books like Miracle of Love or stuff about Swami Papa Ramdas or Yogi Ram Sarat Kumar or Ramana Maharshi, people having these kind of experiences all the time that are unexplainable and inexplicable to the Western psyche and the Western mind. So I was 20 at that time. So now I'm 62. So 42 years later, I find myself in a position 
where I feel consumed by my teacher. But from the inside out, not from the standpoint of I need to get him in here, read enough books or look at enough pictures. Some seed got planted that is now coming apart from the inside out because I lived and breathed for decades the world of, oh my God, enlightenment, the guru. This is the most extraordinary, special, incredible state that anybody could ever achieve. And I want that because of course, if I were to attain that, everybody would love me. I would be maximally lovable at this point. I would be the peak of you're okay, because that's who the spiritual person is. And so I wanted that. I wanted that with everything I had. And I threw everything at it. Practice and meditation practice and reading everything I get my hands on and traveling around and doing years and years and years of intense Vipassana practice and going to Vipassana retreats and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the way my guru, Lee Lazowick, has worked on me and with me has been to, this is my view of it now, and this may very well change as time goes on, totally fan the flames of that pursuit for me. He totally encouraged this kind of intensity of practice, of desire for attainment, desire to achieve something spiritually, and praised my efforts and would encourage a view for myself that I was understanding something about this process. And it was probably seven or eight years after he died that this whole pursuit unraveled for me. And I started seeing and looking at what I think he was wanting me to see all along, which is how very separate I still was and how much my life was a practice of separating myself from other people. Even a bunch of spiritual experiences that felt incredibly profound for me were used as a way to separate, were used as a way to feel, oh, I'm getting there. I'm getting closer to being the most acceptable, okay person in the room because I'm having these experiences. And then that all started collapsing. I just started seeing and looking at my fear, my anxiety, my desire and intense need to be loved, accepted, liked by people, and how pretty much my whole life revolved around getting for myself some sort of approval, attention, gain. I don't know what to say. I didn't come in knowing what to say. So I'm just exploring the thread. And what I see in retrospect is the guru isn't a person. The guru is a field that is connected to a very broad field of influence that is in absolutely no rush to help us. The guru is not in a rush to speed things up or get us there quickly. In fact, I would say, looking back, that my guru was in more of a rush to deepen my suffering and the suffering of those, (laughs) in many cases, around him so we could get to the point quicker where we'd be like, okay, this really isn't working. And I don't know what this is. I don't know what this mystery, this energy is. 
a number of beings there are so many stories about have gotten so close to this source. And it even happens now. When I think about Lee, particularly now, because Lee is for sure my root guru at this point, my primary anchor and source of help and connection. When I think about Lee, something shifts inside of me just by putting my attention on him. And I just don't know how that works. And I read books. I read books by Lee or books by Papa Ram Das, especially does this for me, or books of other spiritual masters. And suddenly there's something happening I don't understand. I don't understand why my entire being is lighting up and being lifted up and softened and given hope and joy by the words of these people. So can you read whatever I wrote before so I can be reminded of where I was coming from when I wrote that? What the heck is a guru? I had a spiritual teacher or guru for 20 years before his death. The idea of having a guru today seems both in vogue and outdated, depending on who you talk to. But what is a guru? How does it work to have one? Should you have one? What's it like to have one and then move on? Or have your guru move on? Can you be your own guru? Or is life your real guru? Lee Loswick was the living spiritual teacher I spent time with. My flesh and blood interactions with him continue to serve as living sources of influence and guidance in my life. At the same time, I still don't know who he was or is. In this talk, I'll revisit some of the most impactful stories and events that are still revealing their meaning and value to me, and how I'm working with my past and present relationship to my teacher. Yeah, that helps reorient. Yeah. I'm having this thing about storytelling right now. I've been studying and teaching storytelling. And I'm having this experience with storytelling as I go back and look at personal life experiences and especially experiences with Lee. The sort of realization is that, oh, I wasn't there the first time when this happened. It's almost like you have to tell a story once or maybe seven or 10 times before you catch up to what was really going on in that moment. Because when I look at me in my ordinary state of mind as I'm going through the day, I'm not freaking paying attention. I'm just trying to get through the day. I've got stuff going on and deadlines to meet and objects to take care of and a kid. And it's when I go back on things that I remember, and I think memory tends to work like this, is the things you remember are not an accident. And especially if you've spent time around a spiritual teacher, the things you remember, they're doing a kind of magic. It's not like an on-purpose magic where they're sitting there going, okay, now I'm going to make the scarf disappear. They're being in such a way that these things land in your attention. I think they call them termas in Buddhism, these objects that get planted and salted away somewhere, hidden, and then at some point later time show up in your attention. And the idea is then that they work with you in some way, or they bring a lesson or a teaching. I took Aikido actually with a student of Lee's and I took one class and this Aikido black belt, he's many degree black belt. He did this thing where he wanted to demonstrate a certain move. And he said, would you be willing to volunteer? I said, sure. So I walk up in front of him and he says, okay, strike me or try and hit me or whatever he said. I'm like, okay. So I try and hit him. And then the next thing I know, literally the next thing I know, I have no cognizant memory of anything in between. I'm like moving toward to strike him. And the next thing I know, I'm laying on the mat on my back, looking up at this person. But I got there to the floor from a standing position on my back in the most harmonious, gentle fashion 
that you can imagine your body moving from upright to the floor. So I had been totally mastered in that moment. I had been dominated. I had been completely redirected. I had totally lost control at the hands of this martial arts person. But as I'm laying there on my back, the only thought I had was, again, I just wanted to do that again. The feeling of having someone have that much mastery was a feeling of incredible relief. To be in relationship with someone who had that much authority in the competency of their physical relationship with another person. And that's what it was like with Lee almost all the time for me. Somebody who had so much awareness of all the moving parts. I don't know if you have this experience yourself, but I go through life having this feeling like there's a bunch of stuff going on here that I I don't see, I don't have a handle on, it could blindside me, I'm forgetting stuff, I'm avoiding things. And to have somebody who seems to have none of that going on, it can be very unnerving. And it can also be incredibly attractive and very inviting. So on a number of occasions, I had these kind of experiences with Lee. I did a lot have these experiences, but some were more profound. And one time I went to talk to him about something to get his advice on something. It was my first marriage, which was going poorly because I was an idiot and immature. And I went to ask advice from him about something. Because I realized after the fact, I had asked him a version of the same question many times, and I was hoping for a different answer from him. So I would come and ask the question again. And I asked the question, and he waited patiently for me to get the end of my question. And then he tore a strip off of me. He just looked at me and he said, do you think that blah, 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 blah. And he just tore into me. Like, what the hell was I thinking? What was I doing? But again, the most notable aspect of this interchange was that I didn't feel a shred of aggression from him. It was the same feeling that when I was doing Aikido, I felt like I was being deeply cared for. And yeah, I just felt, I felt an immense care and I couldn't make any sense of that. How someone could be that furious with me and like cut right through the bullshit that I was dishing out, but do it in a way where there was no recoil in my body. There was literally no physiological defense put up. In fact, everything relaxed in me the same way as with the Aikido instruction. I just felt like, okay, oh my God. Yeah, I can feel this experience as I'm speaking it. It's so palpable to me and so unique in my lifetime, which is what it's like being with a guru. You don't, this doesn't happen. And, and when it happens for you, that you are introduced to the ground of true being through the portal, through the actions, through the influence of this other person, through a master, the content of your interaction with them becomes irrelevant. It doesn't matter if they're screaming at you. I had an experience with Lee where I went on a trip with him to California he liked to drive. So anytime we went anywhere, he was the driver and he would drive a car full of people. Or even if you were traveling with him, it was just you and him, he would drive. So I was visiting some people in California with him and he had flown out and I drove out. And then after we got there, he told me, and I don't know if I knew this beforehand, but then he told me he wanted to drive back with me. 
I was like, oh, okay. So just going to be me and him on a seven and a half hour drive from California back to Arizona. And so when it was time to go, I knew the drill. I took out my keys and I held out the keys in my hand. He said, no, you drive. I was like, oh, okay. That made me really nervous. So we get in the car and I'm sitting there behind the wheel and I'm driving for seven and a half hours with this person next to me who's taking me apart in silence, piece by piece. I can't escape. I can't go anywhere. Fortunately, I have something to do. I'm driving. But my every move, how I'm signaling, how I'm shifting, I'm so nervous and so self-conscious because my guru is sitting right there And I tried, I think I tried three different times to ask him a question. And I'd be sitting there for hours going, okay, he's always said he wants good questions. So I'm going to think of the best question and I'm going to ask him a great question and then we'll talk. So I'm sitting there, spent like an hour and a half formulating the best question I can come up with. And I lay it on him and he goes, "Uh uh-huh. Or... I don't even remember what he said, but every time, like complete, or he would just say yes or no, or I don't even remember what he said. All I knew was that he was doing something else and talking wasn't part of the plan right now. And I just remember how it felt as we got closer to home and that last half hour in the car, what was going on in my body that was this feeling of uh, that I was coming apart and disappearing like into just pure heart. And when we pulled up to the gate of the ashram, I wasn't living at the ashram, but I took him to the gate. And as he was about to get out of the car, I just wanted to reach over and just say, don't go. I didn't want him to go. I didn't want him to ever leave the car. But like I could have just like driven forever with him next to me. Because the quality of this person's being was so profoundly rooted in something clean and pure and trustworthy. So because of the potency of that energy in these masters and in Lee, I found myself always triangulating between being unnerved, deeply moved and touched and attracted, and terrified. I would just flip-flop, There'd be times and opportunities to spend time with him or be with him. And sometimes I'd just be like, I, because he was also fierce. He could be so fierce. It it was always from this place that was so profoundly clear. And then (laughs) when you think you've got this thing figured out, this guru thing, okay, this is this incredibly high being. There's nobody like this I've ever met anywhere. I don't know what this is, but this is transcendent beyond the beyond. So then I'm on a trip to San Francisco. We're in a van with 16 people in it. He's driving. I'm sitting in the front seat. We're going down a very steep hill in San Francisco. As those of you who've been there know, there are very steep hills. We're going down this hill and a homeless man starts walking across the street randomly as we're driving down the street. And Lee is trying to get something out of his wallet, or I don't remember what he was doing. But we are bearing down on this homeless person, and he has no idea that the guy is there. And I'm sitting in the passenger seat going, he's the most aware person ever that I know. So I see this. I see the homeless guy you know, ways off. Like, so I'm not going to say anything. But as we're getting closer and closer in the van, I'm like realizing we're about to 
run over this homeless man. And I start going, Lee, Lee, Lee. And then I'm like yelling and Lee looks up, slams on the brakes. And we come to a screeching halt like three inches from this homeless guy. So things like this would happen all the time where you've got this guru guy. Again, what the heck is a guru? Because the guru is clearly also a human being. Flawed, fallible, weird, eccentric, odd, with all these quirks and eccentricities. And even for a lot of people, annoying stuff that they would do. And then you have everyone who's surrounding the guru making up stories about why the annoying, eccentric, weird, neurotic stuff is actually transcendent and how it's a teaching for us. And we're supposed to learn something from it. And maybe that's true, but I don't know if that was actually true. It seemed like all this stuff was going on at the same time. And all I know is that. Somehow, it's clear to me that it's possible for this thing called a human being to be altered in such a way that it can fully channel a transhuman benediction and energy and force and blessing. That is absolutely clear to me. How that coincides with it coming through an actual human being who has all the usual or a lot of the same stuff going on that we all have going on. I don't know. I don't know how that works. And we were forever trying to make sense of it, those of us who are students. And I don't know that you can. There's so many stories. There's so many incidents At one point, I had some things going on where I entered some very altered states, the kind of altered states that it's easy to then fantasize you've realized something or you've made some kind of progress or you've arrived someplace. It's very easy to become super fascinated by the sensations of naturalness. And I say this because it's taken many years and over time, I see, it's always been in my mind, oh, enlightenment, that's what I want. That's the highest, most incredible, rare, unique state. That's what I want. And at this point, I see and feel my ordinary waking psychological neurotic package state as being the most extraordinary thing because naturalness to naturally just be a human being in full awareness of who and what you are without putting on an act or a mask or a show is the most natural thing to be non-separate from all and everything is the most simple, natural, ordinary, non-achieving, non-special thing there is. And the special thing that we all magnificently pull off is to be incredibly separate in very unique very odd, aggressive, creative ways. And that's the actual achievement in the face of the fact that the fabric of reality in the universe is simple, basic, obvious oneness and connection that we pull off the extent of a sense of being separate and anxious and suffering over that is the miracle. That's an amazing thing. So I went through many, many years of being ultra personally fascinated by the sensations of an altered state of consciousness, which was a very refined and high form of reinforcement of self, reinforcement of of me 
oh, wow, this is the most special thing anyone has ever experienced, and I am experiencing it, and everyone should know in some way, shape, or form. So I had one of these experiences, and I was in a state of non-dual perception, and I was like, this is it. I'm done. I've arrived. This is the end of the path. And now everyone's going to see it. Everyone's going to clearly recognize that I should be a guru. And as soon as that becomes seen or I show my teacher, he's going to say, go, this is your job now. So I'm in this state and I walk into the office where Lee is and He would usually want to just talk to people at his desk, but there were a lot of people in the room. And this thing that was going on was very special. And when you need special attention, what you say to him is, can we go out in the other enclosed deck out in front of the offices? So I asked if he would come out there to talk to me. So he gets up from his desk and we go out to where it's private. And I look at him. I don't remember what I said. But also he could recognize that something had shifted. And I think I said something like, I just want to walk out that door and go out into the world with nothing. And I'm done. I'm done with the world. I don't need anything. There's nothing I need. I'm complete and completely whole and full. And if he had said, go, I would have walked out that door. I mean, I had two kids and a wife and a life. I would have walked out that door and just started walking down the road, wandering the way Swami Papa Ramdas did in the books that I read about him. And I thought that was the goal and I'm ready. And so I tell him this and he looks at me and he just says, well, looks like some discipline is in order. And he very quickly just went, what the hell are you thinking? It's nothing, basically. Go pay attention to your kids and your family and do your job. That was his response to me sharing that experience with him. And this is the thing, is that for somebody who feels incomplete and not fully lovable and not whole and like they're not enough, There's an incredibly deep need to see and to keep looking for something to achieve. And this thing that the guru is trying to lead us toward or point towards is so ordinary. It's so simple. It's so immediate. I think it's very difficult for them to guide, direct. There's a lot of trickery involved in this process. And I think there was on the part of Lee to keep us interested enough to stay on the path, whatever the path is, long enough to be undone, long enough to finally, finally, that word doesn't even apply because who knows what finally is, long enough to actually come up against yourself and actually see, oh, okay, here's what I'm up to. Here's how I'm running. Here's how fear runs me. Here's how I'm always looking for territory. Here's how I'm always looking for a position to hold on to and how I'll defend it at all costs against anyone else who challenges me on that territory. Yeah, it's taken me a long time to begin that part of the path, to really have a relationship to what's really going on in the domain of ego, separation, control. I remember one time I was supposed to talk to somebody at the ashram. and. We had scheduled for me to call him in the office at a particular time. And it was early in the morning. I was going to call before meditation. And I was traveling for work. So I was in an Eastern time zone, either Central time or Eastern time. 
And I got confused on the time. And so I wound up phoning at like 5 a.m. Meditations at 7 a.m. I think it was supposed to be that I was supposed to talk to this person at 6 a.m. And they were going to be in the office. But I wound up phoning at 5 a.m. Arizona time. And the phone rang and it got picked up. And the person on the other end said, hello? And it was Lee. Have you ever got up in the middle of the night and gone walking or got up really early in the morning to go for a walk before anybody else is out? And there's this feeling like you're being let in on a secret where the birds are just starting and the sun is just rising and there's no one else around. The day is just beginning and you're, you're like being let in on the secret. Lee was up for some reason, nobody else around, I'm sure. And he answers the phone. That's what it felt like. And that one hello, the door had been opened and I was being let in on a secret. The tone and quality of his voice was utter and complete welcome. He didn't even know who was phoning. He just says, hello. And then I got really nervous. I was like, oh, uh, is so and so there cuz i was looking for this particular person he said um no just me in the office I said oh okay well and then i realized i'd gotten the time wrong and i said i'm really sorry to bother you or something i stammered i was you know i was nervous and just said something silly and he just said you just said on the phone no problem call anytime And the mood that he was in was just exuding, there is no problem. It's all workable. There's essentially no problem. And in that moment, he was just entirely resting in that. And it just came through in the the quality of his voice. And that's another thing that I think a lot of people experienced, that the quality of his voice, if you get a chance to listen to any recordings of Lee, or some of that probably even comes through his music, although that's maybe harder to access because his voice isn't musical, but the quality of his voice conveyed the sense of relaxation, of depth relaxation. One of my first experiences, maybe one of the most early profound experiences, was reading a book called The Study Manual. Lee was very big on spiritual writing, and he would ask his students to write very often. And he had group projects where he would bring many students together to put together collections of material that was written by students, contributed by students, edited and sourced by him. And there was a book called The Study Manual. And The Study Manual is an introduction to many of the core teachings of Lee and our, what we call a school. And I was leading a study group in Vancouver, where I am now. I was leading a study group back then, like 30 years ago. We were reading from The Study Manual, and I had The Study Manual open in my hand. And I was just reading aloud from The Study Manual. I was busy reading, practically speaking. I was engaged with the activity of holding the book and reading words out of the book. And I'm reading along, and then I hit this phrase, and the phrase was, those who make core distinctions feed me. And as I read the words aloud, I lost control of my body. I went into what is called a bhava, and what it felt like in that moment was that my attention got captured from the moment I was in and removed and entirely placed on him, entirely placed on the quality of the absolute that the guru represents, and it was endless and formless. 
And so I couldn't speak. The book fell out of my hand because I couldn't hold it. I couldn't move my eyes. And I fell over in the middle of the study group. And everyone is looking at me like, what the heck? And I couldn't do anything about it. I couldn't move. I couldn't explain. These states, the only reason I'm sharing that is because this is another facet of the inexplicable energetic field that somehow is at play and somehow creates an influence over the human physiological mechanism of one who is a student or one who's open and receptive to this influence. And it really messes with Carlos Castaneda called this the assemblage point. Like we have a way of organizing our speech, thoughts, identity, physiology in a certain way. And when the locus of that point of attention gets called away to something that's outside of the reference point of our usual idea of who we are, it scrambles everything. So you have this influence of the guru in the mix, occasionally doing this kind of work on people. And it's very confusing. It's very disorienting and confusing for the Western mindset. And then that happened a lot. There was a couple of years where that was happening a lot. And then I started to be able to relax with that a bit more. But as I said, that whole process, it could be easily argued that it slowed me down. (laughs) to have these experiences that I labeled as being important and meaningful and significant. Looks like someone wrote in the chat, searching now for another guru. Maybe that's a question for me, but no, these completely available. So I'm not in search of a external living in the body guru at this point. So several of us have had that rare opportunity to meet one of these kinds of beings in our lives, and vast numbers of us have not. So what's our access or the access of those who do not meet somebody of that caliber? Or have we missed something? You know, Is the path still viable for us? Are we ever going to get that kind of insight that you got in being taken apart by this type of energy? What does one do? I think humans, I think all of us have these experiences of feeling connected beyond the usual frame. Could happen with nature, Maybe you have a a flash while reading a, a spiritual book. Yeah, I don't know how to answer that question, except that I think really everyone has these experiences with the guru in the form of what the guru actually is, that invitation to set down our separate sense. And for anyone who wants more of that in their life, I think there's plenty of opportunity to trust yourself and to let yourself move towards something that might feel like, oh, I'm making this up or I'm imagining this. The most connected sense of being outside of our usual frame is actually a very natural thing. And If you are drawn to that, maybe notice times where you're feeling that and maybe dismissing it because you judge it or think someone else might judge it or you think maybe you're making it up. That's one place I would start. But then reading spiritual literature seems to be an amazing access point. I don't know how that works. I don't know how a book contains the spirit of living masters, but books do. I don't know how that works. It's one part of the what the heck is a guru question. What the heck is a spiritual book question? I don't get how that works, but I know it does. 
And probably everyone in this room has had that experience. I'm curious if you'd share a little bit about the transition between your being a student of Osho and Lee. Yeah, well, I was at Rajneesh Puram when that whole experiment was going on in Oregon, and I was there to the very end when it all folded and was closed down. I left there. I guess I went back to Arkansas for a short period of time, but a good friend of mine who some of you probably have heard speak, Red Hawk. Red Hawk, I've known for almost 50 years. I met him before I met Osho. He and I kind of wound up going to Osho together. I mean, he's just very, very dear friend. And he called me. This was several years, maybe three or four years after leaving the Osho community. And he just said to me, I'm doing a workshop that I'm hosting and I'm looking for participants. And the workshop was led by a senior student of Lee's and Red Hawk. I hadn't spoken with Red Hawk in a couple of years at that point. And he asked me if I would come do the workshop. And I just said, yes, no questions asked. And I went and I did this workshop. As soon as I landed in that workshop, I met a couple of Lee's senior students. That's when the connection was made for me to Lee. And I got found again. I wasn't looking for another guru, but I got picked up. I got drafted by the right team, by the right coach. I think something that is alive for me in my generation and thinking about the generation that is growing up is being very aware of how we're constituted suits a particular type of work. And when you were talking about the moment Lee turned you towards your family and what was alive in your life at that time it just makes me feel kind of inspired and curious about this idea that if this guru thing is about bringing us from our darkness to our light, then that might manifest in our physical bodies in the real world in really different ways. And not everyone is going to be a guru with an ashram. (laughs) Thank God, yes. (laughs) Every single person he worked with was an absolutely individual case. And if you looked right or left at what he was doing with other people, it would be very confusing. It was absolutely for you, the stuff. He was a constant trickster. So I was in my first marriage, which, as I mentioned, had a lot of struggles. My wife at the time gave him some raw nut bars, raw food nut bars, fruit and nuts and whatever was in them. So then about Two years later, I was traveling with Lee. We met at the ashram to get up early in the morning. I think it was one of these California trips. And he comes downstairs and he would travel with travel food often so that we wouldn't have to stop for stuff. And he comes downstairs and he hands me a bag of nut bars. They're these two-year-old nut bars that my wife had given him that are completely rancid. And he hands them to me. This is from my guru. I'm getting prasad food from my guru. And I'm like, what the heck do I do? What do I do with this? And I I couldn't eat them. I didn't eat them. I disposed of them, I guess. I was in a complete quandary about it, and it's arguable or possible, given the kind of stories that we've heard, that had I had the faith and the courage to eat those nut bars, it might have healed my entire relationship in my previous marriage. Who knows what that was about? He would do stuff like that all the time. I remember with my current marriage with my wife, there was a period where he was asking me to give a lot of talks. Boy, was I feeling great about, yeah, you know, he wants me to to speak to people. And he would often come up 
before a talk space that he'd leave blank on the schedule. He'd wait for the celebration and he'd walk up and go, hey, you want to give the talk this afternoon? And that was becoming a regular thing. And you know, I'd prepare something ahead of time. And I remember being outside on this tennis court where we had set up tents for the celebration. And I'm walking down the path with my wife and Lee walks up. It's right before an empty talk schedule. And he's walking up with that look on his face and he walks right up to me and opens his mouth. And, you know, I'm leaning in for, here we go. And I get to give a talk. And he turns to my wife and says, want to give a talk? And I looked so absolutely foolish because he knew I was left there dangling and feeling what I always feel and what I was working with at the time, which is if I'm not getting that affirmation, if I'm not getting someone to say, hey, yeah, you're good, you're worth it, we want you, it was an immediate surfacing of that sense of, oh, what's wrong with me? Why isn't he asking me to give a talk? Yeah, so he he was just doing stuff like that all the time. I was wondering if Lee focused on one discipline or many disciplines. Absolutely many disciplines. He had many different ways he talked about the path. And one way he talked about it was the aim is to be kind, generous, and compassionate as a person. So that was a simple, clear discipline or set of disciplines that he would often focus on. But he just would come up with as many different ways, paths, tools, exercises, approaches, modalities as was necessary to keep any given student engaged. He seemed to be constantly putting out entry points that seem to be for the purpose of giving people different ways to connect, different doorways to walk through, but basically just to be in relationship with him. The core discipline of guru yoga is just to be in relationship with the guru. And it was just constantly creating ways to play games with him, be in relationship with him, do businesses, do projects, create art, play music, travel. Yeah. I want to thank you all for coming and giving me the opportunity and the chance to talk about Lee and the guru with a capital G and really appreciate you listening and helping me to remember what it's like to have the reality of guru be a real thing in existence and in our lives and in our world, whether or not we have met a flesh and blood guru, this is a real thing. And in our tradition, we say Jai Guru, which is victory to the guru. And I wish for me and for all of you that you be as gracefully and effortlessly undone as it's possible for that to happen for you so that you can find the heart of what you're looking for as as a being so thank you very much <laughs>